welcome to numerical methods, numerical methods for mathematical finance. But um, a lot of numerical methods that we will see, yeah, they yeah, are universal. Yeah, so you can use them in many other applications, and we will use. Um, problems for mathematical finance, say, as an application to get a deeper understanding into the method or to illustrate the method, or it is our motivation for yeah, developing um, the numerical method. And before we start with the numerical methods, there are a few other things to do. And one thing I would like to do, I have a small teaser here that illustrates you an important aspect that will be the topic of the following session, computer arithmetic. And my little teaser is, let's consider here, say, um, a numerical method. So my numerical method, the thing I would like to do is I would like to approximate a partial derivative. Yeah? So you see here the partial derivative uh, of a function. I assume the function is uh, sufficiently smooth. Uh, and maybe you know that you can approximate this by a finite difference, evaluate f at a slightly shifted point, x0 plus h minus evaluate f at the original point, x0, and then divide by uh, the shift size. Yeah? So the finite difference approximation. Actually, this pops out of Taylor's theorem. Just use Taylor's theorem, uh, say, up to a certain order, and then just rearrange the terms. And yeah, from Taylor's theorem, you also have a theoretical result, the error. Okay, the next term is something h squared, but since you divide here by the h, the error is of the order um, h. So we we think that we should choose h small. Yeah, you can have an implementation here. Yeah, so there is here your, your function f. Okay, there and there. So I have the function f implemented here, yeah, and I can just apply to this function, say, the value plus the shift and the value, take the difference and then divide by the shift. Let's try this, say, here for an example, and I take a very smooth function, I take the exponential function, and we take... Um, as the point, just x0. So I know the uh, derivative of the exponential function. I know it analytically. It's the exponential function. And if we you know, take the uh, x0 here, uh, then we just get uh, equal to, that this is equal to 1. Yeah? So if I plug in the point x0 equals to 0. I know that the derivative I would like to expect uh, is equal to 1. Yeah, now comes my little experiment. Let's try our implementation with different shift sizes and compare the uh, result. Let's, let's do that on the computer. So I have here a small Java project prepared, but there's nothing in there. It's an empty project. OK, just created an empty project. Uh, let me create the package so everything is in packages so that is a little bit ordered. So this is, say, numerical methods lecture teaser is the main, the name of the package. And then inside this package, I create a class. So this is, let's call it finite difference approximation teaser. Okay, I would like to have a main method so I can run the class, yeah, so I have actually just a class that is a small program. Yeah, my function, what is my function? Yeah, there is a, a thing that says that I have a function from a double precision floating point number to a double precision floating point number. So my function should be the exponential function. So actually I can write this in this form. I need to import this here. So this is my function. Then I would like to have my point where I would like to evaluate the function. And the first thing is that I know the analytic solution. So let me just check what is the analytic solution. So this is the derivative analytic. Okay, the derivative analytic is the exponential function evaluated at that point. Yeah, so I just print this.
Okay, so just print this out, and I would like to see that this prints um, a one. Yeah, so let's check if this runs here. Okay, yeah, and indeed the analytic derivative is a one. Let's now go back to our slide uh, and just implement here this uh, formula. The approximation is the function applied at a um, shifted value minus the function applied at the unshifted value divided by the shift size. So I define now a shift. Yeah? So maybe I use a small shift. Let's take uh, 10 to the minus 15. Yeah? So well, take 14. Yeah? 10 to the minus 14. Um, a small, small shift. Oh, yeah, done. Evaluate the derivative approximated. Okay, this is now what we have on the slide. So it's the function evaluated at x plus shift minus the function evaluated at x and the difference then divided by the shift. So let's print this approximation. So this is my approximation. And maybe also calculate the error. Okay, the error is uh, what I get minus what I would like to have. This is the error, and I also print the error. So yeah, a bit lazy, so just copy this and modify it. Make it a bit nice. And I have a small program. Checking now my numerical method. Okay, let's run this numerical method. <clears throat> okay, and you see, yeah, this is uh, almost one here, but actually the error, this is fairly large. Yeah, so this is a seven times ten to the minus four, so it's a maybe, maybe. Um, 10 to the minus 3, yeah, so it's like an 0.1%. This, this looks fairly large. Maybe my shift was uh, too too large, yeah. I know Taylor's theorem uh, should choose maybe sh smaller shift sizes, yeah. Okay, choosing a smaller shift size, 10 to the minus 15, I get an error of 11%. So the error is huge. Yeah? Okay, that's strange, yeah. Uh, the smaller shift should have a smaller error from what you know as a mathematician, from Taylor's theorem, from the convergence rate. Actually, 14 was better. Yeah, If you now go to, for example, 10 to the minus 12, yeah, you had to have a 10 to the minus 5 here before yeah, with the 14. It was a 10 to the minus 4. Yeah. So the 12 is actually 10 to the minus 12. The larger shift is again better. Yeah, Let's go to the 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 8. Yeah? The larger shift is again better. And uh, let's go to the 10 to the minus 8 as a shift here. It's, then we get a 10 to the minus 9. Yeah? 6 times 10 to the minus 9, we get a very, very good approximation. Yeah? So this is up to this position here, this is uh, agrees with the analytic solution. So the strange thing that you see is, actually the smaller shift is not better. Yeah, Something is going on here, and that's why my teaser is here, things can go wrong. Okay, so just knowing the numerical method from the theory is maybe not enough. And this is also one thing I would like to teach you in this lecture here. So we need to have a very deep understanding of some numerical methods to also understand the things that can go wrong and to make these things right. Just imagine that you do something like this in your thesis. Yeah? Uh, you have a thesis where you would like to check a result. And if something like this happens deep inside of your thesis, you have a error of 10% in some calculation, and you are not aware of this, yeah? then maybe your results could be completely wrong, and the result of your thesis could be just a computational artifact. Yeah? It's not the true, true thing that you see. So this is um, the code that I just wrote yeah, with a little bit more comments. 
the observation that we have, the interesting observation is that the error becomes smaller as age increases, at least in this, uh, this interval, and recall Taylor formula suggests actually the opposite. When I do these programming examples, you can always find these programming examples in a Git repository that is associated with the lecture. So you can check this out. So this here is the URL of this repository. Okay. And then you find in a certain package, so things are a bit ordered, uh, in a certain package, here it was that package, you know, the teaser package, you can find this uh, little class and you can just try it and run it. Um, my project that was here is actually empty. Yeah, it is because I just do this for this demonstration. The things that we will do during this lectures, yeah, there are many different packages with many different things on many different uh, methods. So don't be confused if you check this pack, this project out now and there's so much stuff. Yeah, just look into the package that is interesting for you. Yeah, that one or today maybe also computer arithmetics yeah, and you find some examples. Later, we will also use uh, the FinMAT library here, which has a lot of mathematical models yeah, uh, and numerical methods implemented. So there's a lot of other code we can study and use, yeah, but everything will go step by step. So that was a little teaser. Yeah. So now coming back to the lecture, aim of the lecture. So what I like to do is actually, I would like to teach you numerical methods. So we will see some important numerical methods, but I also like to teach you the implementation. And these things come together. So the lecture is useful also for other um, applications. So we will discuss applications in mathematical finance. And these are good because they give us motivation. Yeah. So what is an application? Why are we doing this? But they also give us intuition of what is going on. Yeah. So what is maybe the, the expected result and what, what do we see? When I talk about implementation, there is another aspect. Um, understanding what the computer is doing and where something could be wrong is one aspect. But another aspect is that I would like to teach you to create clean, efficient, and also extensible code. Yeah? So what we are creating is a little bit during the lecture, uh, like a library. Yeah, We will create little building block. And the thing that is important here is that the code is reusable. Because if we do this, then we are slowly step by step building up a laboratory. Yeah? We are building up several components which we can combine and we are getting more powerful each step. Yeah? So it's not that we write something and we throw it away. I like to build up say a kind of laboratory which gives us more insights into again back the theory or the application so all these things they are combined a little bit so we we combine skills in theory application yeah modeling numerical methods and they are connected for example if you do understand the theory as a mathematician, so a stochastic differential equation, yeah, that provides you some intuition for the numerical method. So what do you like to do? Yeah, what it is. But also you can go back. Yeah. So I am sometimes thinking if I do some research, yeah, I'm sometimes thinking in terms of, okay, the implementation, how the things are connected, and that helps me to understand the theoretical result. So these things are connected. So it also provides you some um, intuition 
back. If we have the um, knowledge about the theory, so there is here the theory, but also the knowledge about the application, then this really helps in creating better implementations. So this helps us in creating better implementation designs. So this is the thing that I would like to create reusable code. Yeah. So what are actually the mathematical objects that are relevant? Yeah. So maybe later we will see a random variable, a time discretization, a Brownian motion, a stochastic process. Yeah. All these objects yeah, are maybe good objects that can be re reused in many different situations. Yeah? Many different models are built upon a Brownian motion. So for our numerical method, we create an implementation, but we also take care that the implementation design is good. And having the good implementation design gives us actually a laboratory. And this laboratory allows us then to do numerical experiments. Yeah, we can play a little bit with the parameters and see what is happening. Yeah, like we played here with the shift size and we see that some strange things are happening. Yeah? And this gives us then back new insight into the theory, the numerical method, or the um, application. So this is really helpful. Yeah? A lot of ideas yeah, for some papers yeah, came from actually experiments I did where, where things were going wrong, yeah? where things were, were a little bit strange and um, I could play play around with my code, I, I could extend my code. So this is really um, a very, very helpful thing. So it's not only that we have uh, numerical methods in this lecture here, yeah? so we will also touch the other uh, boxes. So aim of the lecture is a selection of numerical methods having a high relevance in applications. So we study theory, we study the algorithm, and we study the implementation. Our application is mathematical finance. So we like to understand get a better understanding for mathematical finance through computer simulations, for example. Yeah, and also during the co uh, course, I like to use state-of-the-art software development co uh, tools like you would use, for example, in industry. You know, so while doing this, you learn another skill by this lecture. You, know? you learn to use, for example, some good programming design patterns, that helps you to create reusable components or also some very nice toolings. Yeah. Our Eclipse um, um, IDE yeah, is maybe a standard thing that you have an IDE yeah, where you can run the program, where you can debug the program. But I will also use Git, Maven for a build process and maybe you can have a look at uh, unit testing, JUnit or something like that. Important aspect of the lecture is that you should have fun. Yeah? So have fun with coding. So these examples are really interesting. Yeah, And um, I hope this um, motivates you a little bit playing around with the code and yeah, also becoming a good programmer because that gives you then a deeper understanding of the underlying theory. Maybe helpful for a thesis project or whatever. Let me conclude this introduction with a motivation from mathematical finance, where you actually see that there are many components coming into play. So the classical example is maybe the risk neutral valuation of a financial derivative. And there is the universal pricing theorem yeah, or the valuation of a financial derivative. So a financial derivative means I have some payout that depends on some yeah, financial quantity that we observe. For example, it depends on the value of the stock. Yeah, so there's the stock value here. And for the value of the stock, I have a model. This here, log normal 
process. Yeah? So the initial value of the stock is given, and then my model has, um, say, a few parameters. Hmm? There's here this R and this sigma. And um, then I have a second asset on my market. This asset is my bank account. So my bank account is also, whoops, my bank account is also, say, you could say a stochastic process, yeah, but actually it's not stochastic. It is given here by this ODE, yeah? so it's also a time-dependent function here um, that gives me the value. And, okay, you know the solution of this guy. The solution of this guy is just N of T is initial value times exponential RT. Yeah, so this is here depicted below. So we have this here is the evolution of my bank account. But my stock has maybe a more um, advanced model. There is here a part. This is the Brownian increment. You know, the infinitesimal increment of a Brownian motion. So this generates some stochasticity. So you see that um, actually here the, the drift part is similar, yeah? So we have actually the same drift going here in the middle. So we are also drifting with this exponential function, but we have some stochasticity. So this is actually here creating a kind of distribution. So this is now my model. My task is that I would like to value a financial derivative. So my financial derivative is now defined is a payoff. So this here is the value of the financial derivative at some future point in time. Okay, so this is my payoff of the financial derivative. So what does it pay? So it pays a function of the value of the stock at a certain time. So maybe there is here time capital T. So I would like to evaluate this random variable. Yeah? So the slice here through my stochastic process at this uh, time. And then you know that the universal pricing theorem tells you that you can express today's value as an expectation of the future value of this financial derivative. So this is here actually my function, my function f of s of t. Well, multiply it with the ratio of the numerea yeah, at evaluation time divided by at payment time. So yeah, that multiplied with my discount factor yeah, coming from my bank, bank account. So this is the problem from mathematical finance, and there are a lot of there are a lot of things to do if you would like to solve this numerically. Of course, for this uh, model here, you can derive Black-Scholes uh, formula and there is an analytic solution. Hmm? Um, uh, if you can calculate the uh, um, corresponding integrals numerically. But let's consider now the problem uh, that we would like to calculate this uh, numerically. Okay, what, what do we have to do? So you saw that I have the task to approximate an expectation of, say, um, a random variable. Yeah? So there is here the random variable x, yeah? this uh, payoff of my model value multiplied here with the numerator, and I would ca calculate, would like to calculate the expectation. So actually calculating the expectation is you know, a numerical method here in our lecture. This is the Monte Carlo method, which we will study here. So you can maybe have a look here. Yeah, This is exactly the thing that we would like to do. Yeah, given 
a random variable. So there's here some expectation. Do we have a numerical method, say something that approximates this expectation right, with a certain um, accuracy? Yeah, but how do we get here this random variable, this S of T? Well, this S of T is hmm, the result of a complicated model. Yeah? So how do I generate this random variable? So this S of capital T, this comes from a model, and the model has certain model parameters here. Yeah? And then I have a stochastic differential equation describing how the model evolves. So I need to create an approximation to the solution of a stochastic differential uh, equation. So this here is the time discretization of stochastic differential equations that we need to do here. Yeah, the time discretization of this stochastic differential equation is, for example, given here by the Euler approximation. So later we will have to study the Euler scheme, yeah, time discretization of stochastic processes. So this approximation here, the Euler scheme, is just that you can approximate, say, this differential operator here yeah, by a finite timestamp, actually like a finite difference. Yeah, and then you see that the D becomes a delta. Yeah. So you have practically here that the next value of the stock is the previous value of the stock plus some increment. And in this increment here, there is your Brownian motion. And now you know what this is. This guy here is a normal distributed random variable. So I now know that my stock at the end is the sum of some normal distributed random variables. Then I can plug this in to this uh, function here, evaluate this. Yeah, But actually now to apply the Monte Carlo method in the computer, I need to generate samples of this random variable. So the next step is that for this Brownian increment for this vector of the Brownian increments, I need to generate drawings. So I have all these increments. Drawings for this random vector. And for that, I need to generate random numbers in the computer. So uh, another chapter will be the generation of random numbers. So we will study algorithms to generate random numbers, and we will also investigate yeah, the convergence, the accuracy, and how to improve the generation. Maybe as a last part of this motivation here, so now we have this algorithm to calculate the value of the financial derivative. So the bank knows what is the price, Yeah, maybe it would like to get for the financial derivative if it sells it, but actually what's going on there? So, and if you recall how you arrived at the universal pricing theorem, then actually there was something interesting underneath. Yeah? The foundation was that you can replicate the payoff using a replication portfolio. Yeah? So this risk neutral, in risk neutral evaluation refers to the fact that you can neutralize the risk by creating a self-financing replication portfolio. So, but how do you set up this replication portfolio? So I know that it is a portfolio of the instruments that I can trade on the market. So here it is actually a portfolio consisting of my bank account N and my stock S. This is the model for my market was given by modeling N and S. So the question is, what's here this phi one, for example, that determines how many stocks I should buy. 
the phi zero is defined by the self-financing property once you have the phi one. And maybe you recall that this is like, um, yeah, comparing coefficients. So the phi one is given by differentiating your value, your valuation, for example, your Monte Carlo valuation, with respect to the initial value of the stock. So my phi one is actually a partial derivative. So we arrive at the next numerical method. We need a numerical method for calculating and approximating partial derivatives. So now you saw in my teaser that this can get, go wrong. And actually, it can go terribly wrong if you use this method to calculate the partial derivative of a value that has been calculating using a numerical method like the Monte Carlo method. So differentiating a numerical algorithm, you have to be very careful. Okay, these are a few of the topics yeah, which you already touch if you just have this problem of valuing a financial derivative and calculating the hedge ratio, calculating the uh, replication uh, portfolio, which is a very classical um, application. And you see there are a lot of different numerical methods uh, associated with this, and I like to uh, touch all of them. So that was my small motivation. So the next session will be something completely different.